Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist with an interest in all things anti-aging. And today I've brought back two familiar guests on this channel to debate the science behind red light therapy. Dr. Chen Xu is an experienced aesthetic specialist with a background in emergency medicine and surgery. She's also the co-founder of Rejuvenate Medical Clinic, which offers red light therapy for a range of uses. So she has an interest in this subject and particularly good knowledge. And if you want a very helpful overview of the different forms of red light and their uses, you'll find it in this interview with Dr. Chen right here. Ivan Galenin is the founder of Adipo Skincare. Previously, he trained in inflammation research with Sanofi before going on to work with the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Now, he spends a lot of time researching the skin's regenerative abilities and the best ingredients and methods to support them for his skincare company, which is why he has a good command of the various studies out there. His background combined with the fact he digs and questions some of the conventional thinking around the most popular skin treatments is what gives us a genuine debate. But I'll also be featuring dermatologists and other scientists and specialists in the discussions I have on this channel. So let me know if that's you and you'd like to take part or if you have any suggestions. To be clear, I choose the participants. No one influences that and no one pays me to appear on this channel. What I aim to do through the mix of content and contributors is present a range of evidence and views that may just help us think through what we apply to our skin day in and day out and potentially for years. And to follow up on the tretinoin discussion, which you can find here, I'll be speaking to a leading dermatologist on the channel soon about both tretinoin, often referred to by the brand name Retin-A, and hyaluronic acid, so watch out for that interview. And remember that in skincare, in the absence of long-term studies, large-scale trials that follow participants for 5, 10, 15 years, there are very few definitives. And what we're really looking to do in these discussions is widen our thinking about how we approach skincare. So today, we pose the question about red light therapy. Could too much of it be a bad thing. Well, thank you to both of you for um, returning to the channel for a second debate, hot on the wheels of the tretinoin one. And um, this time we're looking at red light and whether too much of it can be a bad thing. And I also have a few questions to pose from viewers as part of this discussion as well. So I'd like to start, if we can, with Dr. Chen because um, this is an area of expertise for you. Can I ask you just to run through the different forms of red light and their uses and benefits and, and let us know which is best for anti-aging? So essentially, uh, red light is a, a particular wavelength of light that appears red, that you, you see it as red. Um, and um, in terms of the different forms of red light, you can get localized machines and whole body machines. Um, and I'm sure a lot of viewers are already familiar with those uh, red LED masks um, that in the beauty sector um, has been quite used quite often. Um, and in more recent years, there's the kind of more of the whole body red light therapy has become more and more popular. The red light is a particular particular wavelength of light that can penetrate quite deep into the skin. And um, they, it, it does many things, but the main thing is that it can help to improve mitochondrial function. Mm -hmm. um, and that, those are the bits of the cell that produce energy. One of the things is that it can help the cells produce more energy, help the body produce more energy and that therefore then function better. Um, it also helps to balance out the um, the inflammatory response as well, but it helps to reduce chronic inflammation um, and to sort of dampen down severe um, inflammatory responses. So it's good for things like arthritis um, and just general kind of chronic inflammation in the, in the body. So in terms of anti-aging effects, because it helps the cells to release more energy from food or do that more effectively um the extra energy that the cells have then basically they they can use that to regenerate and to heal and to recover quicker um so the general kind of anti-aging effects is not only on the skin but actually mm -hmm. it works on the whole body um and really the effect is dependent on the amount of light that's exposed to the body and the length of time. And but what about the different forms of red light, which people get confused about between sort of infrared and 
those are basically different wavelengths. So mm-hmm. the visible red light, sort of between 600 and 800 uh, nanometers, mm-hmm. those are kind of in the visible um, range. 800 is kind of approaching the um, the, in the invisible part of the spectrum. So the near infrared is a longer wavelength of light that um, is not visible to the naked mm-hmm. eye. Infrared light is even longer wavelength of light that basically can sort of, it produces heat and it can um, penetrate much deeper into the body, but you can't see it. So it's it's invisible basically. So red light is the visible part um, of the the wavelength of the spectrum. Basically in sunlight, uh, white light, you have a a whole range of different wavelengths of light um, from uh, ultraviolet, which again is invisible, but it's very short wavelength. It's um, on one end of the, the spectrum. Then you have start to get into the visible part of the spectrum, starting with violet um, through the whole colors of the rainbow into mm-hmm. the red end of the spectrum. Well, that was um, one of the questions that uh, a viewer sent in was, you know, because it's it's present in sunlight and daylight, why, why do we need to supplement or why should we supplement? That's a very good question. So people who have been exposed to um, plenty of sunlight will get the whole spectrum of light in mm-hmm. in the sun, and it has the beneficial effects that the red light can offer the body, but it also has a harmful effects from the UV rays that can damage skin. They're, most things are pros and cons. So the UV rays are also needed for production of vitamin D. So red light mm-hmm. actually doesn't stimulate vitamin D production. Mm-hmm rays do uv light to do but then uv rays can also damage the skin and age the skin so there is this balance of you know do you need to it's good to get a bit of sunlight but if you are if you're out in the sun for too much it can age your skin quicker you know personally i would get a bit of sunlight just normally walking around i put my sunscreen on but i also take vitamin d supplement um yeah. and i would prefer to get red light treatment because that's concentrating the the good part of the the sunlight um and you sort of using the benefits of that as it were okay without the harmful effects of the uv rays i want to go now to ivan just who has been looking at some of the scientific studies relating to red light um can we start ivan with the good stuff that you found out about red light yeah, it it very clearly works, um, and and really, I mean, compared to red nay, I would say it um, it's there's suggestion that it actually works uh, on more parameters. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the the body of clinical work supporting red light is not near the same as the body of clinical work support, supporting red nay, mm-hmm. um, but it does seem to have a broader uh, anti aging efficacy. Than, than Retin-A, I would say. I mean, some of the studies have been very good. The, the study that everyone focuses on, which was done in 2007 in Korea, in mostly Korean women mm-hmm. with, um, with Fitzpatrick type three and four skin. This is types three and four, where more commonly in Caucasian uh, skincare studies, the skin types that are evaluated are, are, are one, two, and three. But it it the study that was done was really quite, good. So red light does work. And here's the really interesting thing. It works in a natural way. One month of red light treatment had a positive effect that increased for three months after the, after the people were treated. And specifics about those positives, were, were they seeing an increase, increase in collagen production or what were they... What were they seeing? I think fine lines, coarse lines, even this, um, some melanin reduction. I mean, it was mm-hmm. the typical anti-photo aging a- endpoints. With respect to collagen, they did look at biopsies uh, to see, okay, what, and they saw, um, they really saw structural structural collagen improvements. Mm-hmm. And what I mean is by structural, it's not sort of, abnormal deposition of collagen is in scar tissue. They seem to see beneficial, the collagen fibers were bundled, you know, better, but those results were, I'd say, anecdotal. They, mm-hmm. they provide no statistics about the collagen um, induction results. So that we have to put 
in the in the category of interesting, but not, you know, not definitive science. Dr. Chen, do you have anything to add to that? It's interesting. I mean, red light, even from clinical practice, um, from the results that I've seen, it definitely, definitely does work. Um, but I tend to, so in my clinic, um, we tend to offer the whole body red light therapy more for, for medical therapeutic mm -hmm. uses rather than for skin rejuvenation i can't really comment too much on the the effects of red light on skin but i do when i do microneedling treatments i um add in the red light um at the end of it to, to help with the healing process and mm -hmm. reduce downtime and, and and all that and but generally my interest in red light is more the health benefits and yeah. it does have the benefits to the skin but 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 yeah i think to to use a red light enough to give you that benefit on the skin um is probably if someone has a a mask at home that they use on a regular basis then yes possibly they'll they'll see that benefit but from a in clinic treatment it's just not practical and of course when we're using those masks at home often we're using them very frequently over quite a long period of time and and this is what will come on to now with some of the other research that Ivan's been looking at. I think before we get to that, I think mm -hmm. one of the things that I was startled by looking at this study was the uh, um, pro-inflammatory effects of red light therapy, immediate pro-inflammatory effects. When you look at the biopsy of the skin taken 20 minutes after treatment, there's a significant, very significant induction in inflammatory cytokines six-fold, seven-fold induction of inflammatory mm -hmm. cytokines. And what's what's startling is that in the 15 years since that study was done, no one has really tried to explain what is this inflammatory response that you see with uh, with red light therapy? And does it resolve? How quickly does it resolve? How does it resolve? So an inflammatory response doesn't necessarily have to be bad. So, for example, with exercise, everyone knows that in a post-exercise acutely, you have an inflammatory response that lasts for four hours and resolves. The, the thing with red light is that no one has actually studied this any mm -hmm. further than, you know, waving their hands and saying that it's a maybe a trauma-free wound response. No data for that. Mm -hmm. So that that was interesting for me. Um to see that well i wanted to um just kind of add something there really to say that inflammation is not all bad because of different types of inflammation there's acute versus chronic inflammation and Agreed. it really yeah yeah and it really depends on um why the inflammation is there um mm -hmm. and studies that look at this inflammatory response immediately after red light treatment or any treatment mm -hmm. it it gives kind of a, only a snapshot of the inflammatory markers at that time but it's a bit meaningless uh when you take it out of context on its own when you just look at snapshots because the immediate inflammatory response may actually be beneficial um what's more important is is a long term result of it um, so sometimes acute inflammation can be good, but when you have consistent acute inflammation and too much of it over a long mm -hmm. period of time, mm -hmm. that can then become bad. So uh, yeah. it's always a balance. I couldn't, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with you more. And that's where the other, uh, that that's where you look at the uh, other um, aspect of this. Have people been followed long term? And the answer to that is no. Um, I think that the longest. Uh, term study was uh, followed some tiny group of patients for 18 months. And one of the endorsers of red light therapy who did a uh, review of the clinical studies said, it's safe. People have been followed uh, for 18, as long as 18 months. And there was only one study and like a, you know, a small, mm -hmm. small group of people. Over what so, frequency of use in that 18 month period? Do, can you remember? I, I, I can't remember, but the point mm -hmm. is that the number of subjects in that study were not enough to say that it, it's like 20 subjects. Mm -hmm. So any su any group with 20 subjects is just not enough. And and for, for the authors to suggest 
to make that inference, I think, is irresponsible. And mm -hmm. I completely agree with with Dr. Shen is that you can't judge, you know, that snapshot of inflammation and say, okay, it's bad or it's good. But it's something that merits follow up. You know, especially when you have like a six sixfold and you know sixfold increase in IL one beta, right? You know, classic you know pro inflammatory cytokine. So is it good? And remember that those that clinical picture was four weeks of treatment and then three months follow up. I'm not sure that this is the guidance that most people are getting when they get their their uh, home home masks. They're not, you know, they're not told, you know, use it for uh, four weeks and then don't use it for three months. I'm sure that the manufacturer doesn't emphasize that point because it's not a great selling point, no. right? No, that I mean, that that is a good point because uh, the face mask, um, I think people are using them very regularly over very long periods of time and and you're right i don't think that that has been looked at the the, the effects of that long term dr chen like in, in your practice uh, um in medical practice where you're using red light um what are the frequencies durations do you do you give um patients a break of a few months uh if they've done a course of them i mean what how do you normally approach it um, so again, this is very individualized um, treatment plan. So it depends on what it is they're treating. We've had quite a few people who have come through with long COVID or chronic fatigue syndrome, and they have really found it beneficial to use the, the whole body red light treatment for two or three times a week mm -hmm. uh, for a few weeks. And then they start to notice really good improvements. And then quite often they will naturally give it a break. I think it's different different when you're paying for a treatment versus having a device at home yeah so if you are paying for a treatment then people tend to pay for the treatment for as long as it's um as long as needed for them to see the result and then they tend to stop for a while because then then they feel like they don't need to pay for any more for a bit for a while so we've had a couple of um long covid um patients who have had a course of 10 treatments over a few weeks then they will have a break for a few months and they do find the the results do tend to last for a while and then when they feel like they need, need a boost they'll come back and they'll have a, another course of treatment very recently interestingly recently had um a client with rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. she's quite young and she had rheumatoid arthritis she was on medication and she went to this um, health summit heard about red light therapy and she found us she wanted to try red light therapy. So she signed up to our monthly sub, um, subscription unlimited. So she could come as much as possible. She practically, she sort of came about four times a week. And she, when she started red light therapy, she went, she just came off all her medications. I didn't tell her to do that. She just mm -hmm. decided to do that. Stop taking all her medications for rheumatoid arthritis. And she did it for a month and she did not need to go on her, her medication at all. It was controlling her symptoms. And so she then went on for another month and again, didn't take, didn't have to go back to the medications. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, it's been really effective and, and quite life-changing for her to not be, not needing those medications. Yeah. I know this is only one case study, um, but, you know, but she talked, she heard this being talked about at this health summit. So obviously there are mm. other cases, similar cases. Yeah. Um, so it's really encouraging. And it just makes me as a doctor think, you know, if this sort of much safer, natural way of treating arthritis works, why aren't we using more of it? Absolutely. And do you think as far as, um, you know, I mean, a I think we all agreed that 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 your protocol with tretinoin just sounded so sensible rather than using something without question every single day for the rest of your life you know why not use it in that prime beneficial stage of about three to six months when we know you get all the the major benefits um with tretinoin retin a uh, and then come off it for a while um you know go to something lower strength and and see how your skin responds you can always go back would you say a similar thing with red light? Um, I think I think so. If you are using it to treat a particular condition, then mm -hmm. initially it makes sense in the treatment phase to use it more frequently until you get to that optimum level of functioning or the 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 optimal improvement that that you can get um and then reduce the frequency and to kind of use it as a maintenance um so you know from personal experience i 
I'm sure I suffered from long COVID um, a couple of mm. years ago. I, I I got it at the got COVID in the very beginning working in A and E. Of course. Uh, and so initially, I when we first got the machine in, I was using it just twice a week, not excessively, just twice a week. And after about four weeks, I really noticed a difference. Um, and then since then, I've just been using it once a week or, you know, whenever I can, mm -hmm. uh, but on average about once a week. Um, and it's it's great. You know, I, it's, I don't think that's overdoing it. It's really helped with my sleep. Um, I mean, my skin, I do lots of different things for the skin, like good skincare, microneedling, but I think the red light has helped as well. I mean, this is where we get into the masks at home that so many people have again. Ivan, are you saying that you have a, a concern about people using those um, frequently over longer periods of time? And, 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 and what, what advice would you give? I don't have any reason to be concerned, mm -hmm. right? But I don't, I, I, I think it's, I'm not sure that people are, are getting the right instructions, mm. right? Let's go back to the very beginning. So what does red light do, right? As Dr. Shen said, it 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 um it gives the cells more energy. It it increases proliferation of cells. Mm. So the you know the skin cells may be proliferating better, maybe there's some repair. Um and the study that showed really, you know, pretty meaningful anti-aging benefits. People were treated twice a week for four weeks and that's it, right? Yeah. So I think that's really my point is like look at look at the clinical study, right? And don't think necessarily that if I do like twice as much or three times as much, my benefits are going to be two or three times higher. In fact, mm -hmm. maybe you'll get maybe you'll get worse worse of an effect. Yeah. Yeah. You can and overdo that's, it. That, that's really my only like point with red light therapy is that it seems there's a disconnect between, um, you know, really what the clinical studies showed as being an effective protocol and what people are using in practice. Yeah. And there's also the smaller question of there is, you know, a seemingly a quite a significant acute inflammatory effect uh, that hasn't been followed up, you know, and maybe it's good, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it is good. So exercise is good you know, long-term exercise is anti-inflammatory. It could be the same thing with red light. We just, mm -hmm. no one's yeah, actually- it needs to no, be explored. So why why should we uh, be concerned about frequency of use? So there was a recent study, uh, animal study, a mouse study, where uh, the investigators seeded tumors in the mice, skin tumors, by um, treating the mice with a chemical that would induce tumors. And then they treated them with red light, not for four weeks, but for 20 weeks. And what happened is that the mice uh, developed larger uh, tumors uh, in the in the red light uh, group than than in the non red light group. It's one study, yeah, in mice, mm -hmm. right, and not the protocol that was used in the clinic. But it does at least you know at least create a reason for us to ask, you know, questions, not to change our behavior, but at least to ask, you know, ask questions. Yeah. Dr. Chen. It's, um, it, it's really interesting. Um, everything in moderation, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't have, to, you really can't have too much of a good thing. And if you think about the, um, the way red light works is that it increases energy, um, essentially increases the amount of energy in the cells. Um, but there is a limit to how much energy a cell can produce. There's a limit to how much, how fast the mitochondria can work. And there are other factors involved as well, like um, are there enough um, substrates, that the, the, the basic molecules that the mitochondria actually need to create energy? And if you actually, if your body's lacking certain nutrients um, and, and not having enough of those basic molecules and it doesn't matter how fast the mitochondria can work you're still not going to get enough energy so it, red light is one aspect of it and in terms of this study um this mouse study showing that, that there's a relationship between red light and cancer growth um i think before we jump to conclusions um and start questioning the safety of red light i think there, there are lots of things that we need to consider is one is the intensity of the the treatment the red light treatment and mm -hmm. you know the length of treatment as well um and 
And also, you know, was the red light just shine on this particular area of cancer or was it the whole mouse? <laughs> um, lots of, and the type of cancer as well. And is that a natural type of cancer that would naturally occur in humans without the chemical? Because red light can help the cells um, proliferate, uh, regenerate faster, grow faster. So if it can do that to normal cells, it can do that to cancerous cells. And normally in the body, our, our bodies, you know, as we age, we constantly have cells that mutate and become precancerous or cancerous, but they're normally killed by our immune system most of the time before they become actual cancers and tumors. So, you know, if we have, if we're treating the whole body, we're making the whole body work faster. Maybe there's a chance that the cancer cells will proliferate faster, but on balance, if the whole body is working better in general and the immune system is working better, then it's also better at clearing up those cancerous cells. Yeah. So I don't think you can look at red light, the effect of red light on cancer cells in isolation, because that's not how it works in the body. That's not what actually happens. Yeah. yeah. And I, I guess there's been a lot of studies involving mice with, um, showing something that has not translated to humans as well. So one study with mice, it's, it's hard to draw a lot from that. Ivan, do you mind if we can move on? Because I, I can see we're running low on time and I want to get to the another viewer question about f um, red light and fat loss because it is used on the body sometimes as a, as a fat loss aid. So they're saying, well, if I use it on my face, does that mean I'm going to lose fat volume in my face if I don't want to? There's a really uh, very reputable group, Harvard, Harvard Medical School, um, um, MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology, very reputable, Mass General Hospital. They, they, um, they published a paper a decade ago reviewing uh, the scientific literature around red light therapy and fat loss and basically concluded that they, th they thought it worked. They indicated that there were two uh, potential mechanisms. Um, one was that it created transient pores in adipocytes, allowing lipids to leak out. Another is that it activated the complement cascade, which would cause adip adipocytes to die. Um, and, you know, the, the truth is we don't know. That no one has been able to figure out the mechanism by which red light therapy uh, uh, causes reduction. Yeah. Okay. I think probably one thing we could deduce is if you're you, if you're using a, a a face mask or you know you're you're going for a treatment, it's not going to be a sudden rapid loss of fat in the way that we have seen associated with with some other more aggressive treatments. I think you could draw on that. That's that's really the critical thing. Um, so these these uh, people that wrote this paper s concluded. Uh, lastly, it's worthwhile to note that um, low light uh, therapy parameters used for facial skin rejuvenation and acne treatment are close to the ones used in fat reduction. Therefore, it is possible that facial volume loss may occur while using red light treatment. Uh, this possibility should be considered and safety of red light parameters should be carefully evaluated based on treatment location. Dr. Chen, just closing thoughts from you. Uh, I know that it, it, it was, it's a very concentrated discussion um, and we could talk for, for much longer. What, what are your closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, this is a, a massive topic um, and this is really, we've just touched the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, Generally, based on the majority of the evidence for red light um, and my personal experience and also what I've seen in clinical practice, I am a huge believer and fan of red light therapy. Mm -hmm. I think it is one of the safest and most eff effective treatments there are for a number of different things. Um, but as with any good thing, you know, it's, you've got to use it in moderation. I think you can't have too much of a good thing, um, because there is only so much benefit you can gain from red light. And you get to a point where the more, the more you have doesn't give you more benefit. Yeah. So it's important to recognize that. And, and when you part, go beyond that point of, um, getting more benefits than you there's a potential for harm but based on the evidence that we do have generally is that red light is very beneficial um, for a number of things and I would say for those people who are not sure to have some sort of medical guidance um, 
is um i would recommend that but it's just yeah. very difficult to get that in particularly in the uk when it, when red light therapy is not so well recognized and not well understood ivan closing thoughts from you that's really the whole point of these debates is to stimulate debate it's not to say gotcha you, this is black this is white it's to say like let's 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 try to understand these tools that we have as well as possible and and um and let's not um let, let, let's let's be open to uh to, to to understanding that we don't know everything mm-hmm. and there's some important questions that really we we should still uh, focus on in skincare i feel like there's a there's a um unnecessary desire to have all the uh, questions resolved um, ASAP and have it all be neat and tidy and black and white. Whereas we see in, in fields where there's a lot of scientific inquiry like nutrition, it's constantly evolving. And, and it's very hard to say, okay, this nutrient is good, this nutrient is bad, and uh, there's debate. And that's really what I'm grateful to you, Claire, for giving us a forum, not to argue for one thing versus the other, but to stimulate discussion and thought. Yeah, and 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 that's what I love about this. And um, I've already picked up so much because it's planted in my mind. A seed that had been growing over the last year anyway, you know, just exactly what am I doing here when I'm applying X, Y, and Z without thought on a daily basis for months, potentially years on end, and it has made me um, take a step back and uh, simplify my own routines and I'm very much on board with the idea of not pushing our skin uh, too far, too fast, too hard, and to take a step back, um, you know, from our skincare, skincare sprints that Dr. Chen mentioned the other week and give ourselves a break. And I think maybe one thing we could consider is changing the name of of these episodes from dermal debates to dermal discussions, because I, you know, I I end up always at the end of these agreeing with so much of Dr. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Shen, and and not that I had the position that I disagreed in the, in the, to start with, but I'm exposed to knowledge and experience that I didn't have that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, no, mm. absolutely. Discussion is definitely a better word. <laughs> okay, well, our next discussion is going to be on Botox. Um, and personally, I can't wait. So thank you very much to both of you, and I'll see you then. Thank you okay. very much, Claire. Thank you. Thank you.